Once again, my dear, dear friends, I have delved into Dr. Creepin's vault, and what I've found this time are four true stories for you. A missing girl, a missing graveyard, a strange man in a forest, and the unfortunate case of getting caught short, the wrong place and the wrong time. <laughs> That's got you intrigued, hasn't it? Well, you know what to do. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because I've got some true stories to tell you. So, it's time to listen. I was quite young at the time, maybe around nine or ten. It was a custom of my father to take me up to see his parents who lived in a large home on Stradbrook Island, about a hundred kilometres from Brisbane in North Queensland. It was during Christmas time, so the ferry that led to the island was packed full of tourists and people getting to their homes on the island in time for the holidays. Once departing the ferry, we met with my grandparents who drove us to the heart of the island where their home was. Upon arriving at the home, I was asked to place my things upstairs in the loft where my father and I would both sleep and come downstairs to prepare for a family gathering that we have almost every year to celebrate our family coming together. We started to prepare for the party, setting up mild decorations and food platters on tables that were sitting around the front bricked patio. By around 7.30pm, most of my older family members started to show up, along with friends and distant cousins of mine that I hadn't met in a long time. The party soon kicked off to full swing. There were mostly older people at the party, so I'd gone inside to entertain myself some other way. At about 9 o'clock, a son of my granddaughter's friend showed up with his new girlfriend. They were staying with friends on the other side of the island, and wanted to come along to join the festivities. They came inside to grab drinks and put their things down in the hallway. I began talking to the girl as she became interested in what I was doing at the time. I think I was playing a new video game or something like that. Anyway, she told me she'd come back in later to see how I was going on and went outside to the party. An hour or two later, I remember that she was going to come back inside to look at whatever I was doing beforehand. I became curious and went outside to try and find her. I walked around the gathering of people but couldn't see her anywhere. I asked her boyfriend, but he told me she was probably inside and I should try there. After searching the whole house and going outside to tell the boyfriend that she wasn't inside either, he became worried. Both of us went inside to have a better look, but conjured up the same results. He went outside and asked my grandfather if he'd seen her anywhere. He hadn't. He dialed his cell phone. It rang and rang and rang, and then went to voicemail. He began to look really worried now, and he started to ask people at the party if they'd seen her leave, but no one had seen her for a good few hours. Thinking she'd maybe gotten tired and caught a ride back to the house on the other side of the island that they were staying at, he got in his car and drove back over there, promising to call us if anything new arose. My father, myself and a few other people at the party grabbed flashlights and began to search the surrounding neighbourhood where the house was, while a few others got into their cars and drove off in the opposite directions, in hope of finding her. After searching the suburb and knocking on a few doors, we eventually turned up nothing and decided to head to the police station down at the bay to issue a missing persons report. The boyfriend called us on the way down, saying that the house was empty and that he was going to meet with us at the police station too. Once we arrived, we told the police everything we knew and they decided to open a search party to look for the girl. Myself, my father and the boyfriend got into a car with a police officer while two other cars went off to respecting parts of the island where she may have gone. We began to slowly patrol around the beaches and into the town and surrounding suburbs. It was close to midnight when we got a call from one of the squad cars searching for her the furthest part of the island away. 
The police officer had found her body near the rocky outcrop at Point Lookout. She was bleeding from a small gash in her head and seemed to be almost unconscious, mumbling incoherent gibberish. An ambulance came from the main town and delivered her body to the hospital on the island. Once we knew she was in good care and the boyfriend was there with her, we decided to drive back to the house to get some rest after this very eventful night. In the morning, we drove down with my grandparents to visit her. She was pretty heavily sedated and had stitches in her head from an overnight operation. When I came in, she looked really surprised to see all of us and was asking us what our names were and if we were all family. I later found out that she had a case of amnesia where she could remember everything up to that night but nothing forward. In later years... We'd come to see them from time to time, but she'd always wonder who we were, and I'd always have to end up reintroducing myself whenever we'd meet. The thing that always gets me is, why did she leave the party in the first place, and end up on a beach almost 30 kilometers away with a severe head injury? When I was 19, I had two best friends. One lived a few blocks away, the other the next state over. One unusually warm Thanksgiving night, I was talking with my friend, Lee, who lived down the street. We were with our other friend, Ben, sitting outside Lee's house. Ben was in a tripofan stupor, lounged across the hood of my car. We'd eaten all the pumpkin pie and turkey we could handle, and we were bored. Our favorite bar owner had actually decided to close up shop that particular night, and we had absolutely nothing to do. Suddenly, I blurted out, Road trip! Lee looked at me and laughed. Oh God, what have you come up with now? Road trip. Let's go see Meech. <laughs> okay. Let me just go get my keys and we'll head out on a spur-of-the-moment seven-hour road trip. She laughed and flipped her hair back. I remember she flipped her hair, because she always flipped her hair. I'm serious, let's go. We have nowhere to be until Monday. We can drive back Sunday morning. Lee nudged Ben. Do you hear this, fool? She wants to go see Meech. Ben, barely coherent. Shrugged and said, Okay. About an hour later, Lee and I had thrown a few things into a shared overnight bag, pulled together our cash and <laughs> borrowed Mum's gas card. The gas card was never to be used without permission, unless it was an emergency. We justified it was an emergency. We were going to die of boredom if we didn't go. This was not an idea either of our parents would have thought of as good, so I remember correctly we caught them from the road. Why we couldn't just sleep away the boredom and wait until the next day is a question for the ages. <laughs> Doesn't matter. We took this chance as we did with all of our harebrained schemes, without a care. We drove over to Ben's, whose parents never really cared what he did as long as he was with us. <laughs> poor, poor judgment on their parts. We gassed up Lee's car, which, as I recall, was a Crown Vic. We bought a bunch of sodas and other junk food, and Lee drove toward the freeway. The first few hours of the trip were unremarkable, listening to the same mixtape we'd made weeks prior. Ben was asleep in the back, so we raised the volume on the stereo to cover his snoring. We stopped after about three hours just to stretch, get coffee. Probably around this time is when we called our parents. At this point I took over the driving and away we went. I recall specifically taking the wrong exit and waking Lee, who was now asleep, to ask for change. What? I need change. Why? For the toll. What toll? She asked as she lifted her head and turned towards me. Is that a toll booth? 
Yes, I've said it three times. Wake up, I need change. She sat up and started digging in the console, then scanning the floor of the car. She finally found some in her purse. I handed the obviously annoyed attendant the change, and we were back on the highway. After a mile or two, I confessed. So, uh, we have a bit of a problem. I kind of took the wrong exit. That toll was for the state line. Ah, uh, well, we have to cross the state line to get to the next state, dingbat. Yeah, that would be great if it were the correct state line. Tiff, are you serious? Pull over. What? I'll just turn round. We aren't actually that far out of the way. Thirty minutes tops. I don't trust you. I can't even take a nap now. Pull over. And so pull over I did. On the side of the road, we got out, exchanged seats, and Lee took over the driving again. Ben was finally awake now, just laughing his ass off. Shut up, it's not funny, Lee snapped. Hey, cool it. Mistakes happen, Ben argued back. Yeah, they always happen when she's in control. Then Lee looked at me and laughed. She never stayed irritated for long. She always likes to say I was the bad kid. <laughs> it's all in fun, of course. Because, truth be told, we were both good kids. We just always got into trouble together. Nothing serious, just kid stuff really. We'd been friends since the age of three or four, so there were plenty of years to come up with crazy ideas. So, on we went with our trip. I napped while Lee drove through the night. After traveling for about two hours, we stopped again. Since we just had a couple more hours to meet his house, we switched spots again at a deserted gas station. Why wasn't Ben sharing the driving? Well, his parents had confiscated his license for three speeding tickets. I took the wheel again as I knew the last stretch very well. I'd taken many road trips over the years to see Meech, so I knew the roads, especially as they drew closer to the small town where she lived. I'd been driving maybe an hour, jacked up on coffee, nothing else. Now, it's important to note there were no substances involved other than caffeine, cigarettes, and junk food. So Ben and Lee were snoozing away when suddenly we were surrounded by thick fog. We were reaching an area called the Mountains, which are somewhere between a nice-sized hill and a true mountain. Anyway, point is, it was a cooler climate, higher elevation. I could see nothing but the heavy fog like thick smoke. It was eerie, but I slowed down and kept going. Now here's where it gets inexplicable. I could see something along the highway I'd never seen before. Not in the years prior. Not even the previous summer when I'd driven there. Headstones. On both sides of the road. All the exact same. White crosses. Nestled in a flat area between the so-called mountain. There were rows upon rows of white crosses. They seemed to appear out of nowhere. And it freaked me out. I shook Lee. Wake up. Ben, wake up. Lee, wake up. I was still driving. And there were still crosses. Lee and Ben awoke. Hey, you guys, look out of the window, under the fog. What do you see? Crosses, Lee replied. Graveyard, it looks like, Ben said. That's freaky for sure, but what's the big deal? We're in the middle of God knows where. It's a creepy graveyard, what do you expect? I laughed, but then I stopped. They weren't here last summer. Maybe it's new. Ben chimed in. No, not that many. Do you know how long it would take to dig that many graves and put up all those headstones? And unless they were exhumed and moved thousands of bodies, do you know how many people would have had to die in just a few months? No, no way. 
something doesn't make sense. And then, they were gone. See? No big deal. Told you, Lee said. I kind of relaxed, realizing I was being silly. It was obviously nothing. It wasn't long before we rolled into Meech's drive. Her parents were out of town, and I knew where the key was, so I just grabbed it and unlocked the door. Meech was walking toward the door as we stepped in. We all did the normal hugs and greetings, but we were tired, and so was Meech. It was nearing dawn by this time. She got us settled in the living room, and we fell asleep. And then, someone burst through the door. Lee jumped up and yelled. I rolled over, saw the shadows and said, Hey, guys. It was nobody. Just Meech's brother and a friend. But it did give Lee an awful fright. Stupid Ben slept through that too. The next day, as we all shoved our faces with IHOP pancakes, I asked, So, what's the deal with that creepy ass cemetery up on the state highway? Meech and the guys just looked at me. What cemetery? Like, 60 miles from here. Same road that brings you to town. No clue, Meech answered. Seriously, we were driving and it was all foggy and boom. Cemetery. Meech's brother laughed. <laughs> Dude, there is no graveyard. Yeah, there is, Lee said. We saw it last night. Yep, saw it last night, Ben confirmed. Okay, if you guys don't believe us, let's drive out there. We'll show you, I said. Fine with me, Meech agreed. There's nothing out that way. A few farms, but that's about it. So, as soon as we finished eating, we piled into two cars and headed towards the state highway. I remembered the mile marker that appeared right after the graveyard ended, so I knew how far to drive. And so, we did. And we drove, and drove. No, cemetery. Finally, I pulled over and stopped. Meat stopped behind me, and we all got out. See, told you, no graveyard. It sure the hell was here last night, Ben said. It was, I swear to God, said Lee. Meech, her brother, and their friend laughed at us. Then Meech's brother said, Now that you've wasted our time, can we go? Sure, I said. But there was a damn graveyard here hours ago. We got back in our cars, turned around, and headed back to town. The rest of the trip was fun normal. But every time we were alone, me, Ben and Lee talked about the graveyard. On Sunday we headed back home. We searched the entire way for the crosses, but never saw them. To this day I have no idea what the hell happened. It wasn't a lack of sleep. We'd all napped along the way. It wasn't mind-altering substances. It wasn't one of those things like fully trois shared madness or anything like that. They'd been asleep. I woke them up and asked them what they saw. They'd seen the same thing I did without prompting. So, my question is, what the hell was that? What happened? After all these years, I'm still stumped. I've looked up state, county, and local records to no avail. I hope someday I'll find the answer, but until then, I wonder. Greece, 2011. This happened when I was 15. My grandfather had recently passed away. So we thought it would be nice to take my grandmother to a place where she had met my grandfather so many years ago. We were all spending two weeks holiday in the tiny little island of Mokonos. <laughs> Good thing about this place is that it's mostly little stone brick homes dotted around the forested landscape. Hardly touristy. Anyway, I'll keep this story short. 
my father and I left the house one afternoon and walked around and into the forest surrounding the property. We took a day pack with some standard equipment, our phones and a camera, because at the time, my father worked as a freelance photographer. We began by leaving the area which surrounded the house we had rented and took off towards the centre of the island, where the forests were. We'd left the house just a few hours after midday, as it got quite hot in the middle of the day. So it had reached about six or seven by the time we reached the forest. Knowing we had to turn back soon before it started to get dark, we set up our camera and took photos of the landscape and the various wildlife in the area. So, this is where it all starts to get weird. I followed Dad a little further into the deep reaches of the forest, when we hear something weird. Assuming it's just some form of large animal bunking down for the night, we push on. We come around the corner to find a ravine. Inside of it is a man, weirdly dressed in purple drapes and almost a turban, like formal religious dress in the middle of a deep, dirty ravine, in a forest on a desolate island in Greece. The man was not alone. He had a dirty shovel in one hand, and was digging a large hole. Beside him was a figure. Gender or looks could not be discerned due to the utter blackness at that time of the night. The figure was laying on the ground, face in the dirt, lifeless. My father started to take his camera out from its respective bag. He removed the lens cap and positioned the camera forward towards the figure, hoping to capture a photo of the man in his act. A sharp flash echoed among the landscape, lighting the ravine and trees in a quick release of bright white light. The man snapped around, and his eyes met mine. We ran. We didn't look back at all until we reached the edge of the property. We had no idea how long we'd been running for, so we stopped to catch our breath and glanced back into the forest. Pitch black darker than ever. We shuddered and walked back inside the house. We were due to leave the next morning. By the time the morning had come, we had packed up and prepared to leave the house. As we were leaving, we noticed something on the doorstep. A dirt covered shovel. I spent my formative years in a small town in South Texas. This town was surrounded by cow pastures and <laughs> more cow pastures. Now, this will be important in a minute. One night my family had gone to dinner in the next town over, which was about an hour from our house. We'd left the restaurant and begun our long drive home. About 45 minutes after leaving, I, having the smallest bladder in the universe, had to pee. Yes, I went before we left, but like I said, small bladder. Now, remember when I said there were cow pastures everywhere? Well, that's all there was. After the restaurant, there was a gas station, and then cow pastures. So knowing that we still had 15 minutes of driving left, with no bathroom between there and home, I had little choice but to ask my dad to please pull over so I could find a bush or something on the side of the road to relieve myself behind. We crossed some train tracks and my dad pulled off next to them. I started walking away from the vehicle, looking for a suitable bush, but it was pitch black. I was walking behind the truck, so the headlights weren't helping, and this was long before cell phones. I was going to go another ten feet or so to make sure I wasn't visible from the road, and I tripped over something. It felt strange, like squishy. So, instead of trying to go any further, I'm breaking my neck. I dropped my trousers and <laughs> did my business. So, as I'm getting myself all buttoned up, I start to wonder, what the hell did I just trip over? I thought maybe it was a bag, like a backpack or a gym bag, something large. So, 
Before I started on my way back to the truck, I took the three or four steps back to where it was. Now, remember, it was pitch black. I could barely see my hand a few inches from my face, so I carefully stuck my foot out in front of me and prodded around until I found it again. I bent down as close as I could to try and see what it was, and all I could make out was the outline of a rectangular tag. On the back of a pair of jeans. And those jeans had legs in them. I jumped up, leapt over the legs, and ran back to the vehicle as fast as my legs would carry me. I screamed at my dad, telling him I was pretty sure I'd just found a dead body. My dad threw the car into drive, whipped around, and left. He said he was sure it was nothing but he looked scared. And my dad, a now retired border patrol agent who loved nothing more than tracking people through the bushes and cleaning his guns when my boyfriend would come to pick me up, isn't one to get scared. I was furious with him, but we drove the rest of the way home, getting there in a little over five minutes, as my dad had decided to go about 90 miles an hour the rest of the way home. I, being a 14-year-old girl, immediately called everyone I knew and told them about my ordeal. After effectively notifying my entire ninth grade class, I finally went to bed. I was woken up by the endless ringing of my phone. When I answered, all I could hear were the shrieks of my BFF about the body that was found by the train tracks that morning. The body that I had tripped over, then urinated on the night before. Of course, she was convinced that I would go to prison for this. Now, the scary parts. The dead man, though found right next to the train tracks, was not hit by a train. He was shot once through the head. My dad would tell me years later that he was aware of this stretch of track being used for drugs and human trafficking due to its remote location. But usually they kept to the other side of the tracks where there was coverage. When I told him that I thought I'd found a body, he was afraid there might still be danger and he was not going to put us at risk in case there were still people around. He may not have been too far off. The estimated time of death of the man was within an hour of when I'd encountered him. Hey there. Thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon.